Hey, welcome to Abide Church Online. I'm so excited that you've joined us today. I pray that today's message encourages you. I pray that it challenges you to grow in your walk with God. And as we like to say around here, we pray that it helps you live, love, and look more like Jesus in everything that you do. Uh, hey, today, if you have a prayer request or if you want to support this ministry financially, you can do that at our website, right at abidechurch.com. Now, let's get to the message. Hey, if I haven't had a chance to meet you just yet, maybe it's your first time here. My name is Dan DeBell. I'm the lead pastor here at Abide Church, and I'm thankful that you've joined us today. Today's an, an, a fantastic day, and I'm going to get into some of the details for why this is such a special day for us today here at Abide Church. But um, before I do, before I get into my message, I need to say something really quick. I want to remind you, uh, whether you, hopefully you know this, but uh, we have an election coming up. Anybody know that? Right? Uh, you can tell if it's an election year by the amount of crazy that's going on around us. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like um, the amount of wild things that are going on. And I, I want to encourage you with this. As believers, um, we need to be registered to vote and we need to vote. Amen? Yeah. Um, we need to be registered to vote and we need to vote. The last election, um, I'm going to give us some, some guidelines here really quick, but the last election was decided by, by around 50,000 votes, Okay. And what's interesting is some studies reveal that roughly 40, upwards of 40 million Bible-believing Christians did not vote. Like, that's a staggering number. And even if it's half of that, even if it's a, a percentage, a small percentage of that, that Bible-believing people would not vote is... Um, it's discouraging. It, uh, it, it should uh, ruffle your feathers a little bit. Both of my grandfathers served uh, in the military, and to hear them talk about the importance of protecting our freedoms, what they fought for, and the things that they had to go through so that we could even have today the right to vote, today the right to assemble together like we are right now. Um, for me, I think one of the best ways that you can thank a veteran or a military personnel that lost their life, that gave their lives for our, for our country, one of the best ways that you can thank them is by voting. Amen. It's by being active. Do we need to pray? Absolutely. But also, we need to vote. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a few reminders here, and then we're getting into the message. But uh, here's, here's what I would remind you of. Get registered to vote. You have a little bit of time here to get registered before it's time for, uh, before you can't get registered to vote. But number one is this. Your vote is a, is a chess move. It's not a valentine. Okay, it's a chess move, not a Valentine. I'm not voting for somebody that I love, and that I'm oh I love you so much and I care for you. Look, it's a chess move. I'm making a decision with my vote based on policy. What do I want the future of this country to look like for my kids and my kids' kids? It's a chess move. I'm making a strategic decision based on the policy of what this person is going to do for the future of our country doesn't mean that I love them or everything about them. And you might find somebody that you love and everything about them, but uh, uh, people are imperfect. So there's always most likely going to be something that you don't necessarily like about somebody. It's a chess move, not a valentine. Number two is this. You need to vote God's values, not your feelings. Yeah. If you're a believer, you vote God's values, not your feelings. Well, I feel like this person, I feel like, what does God's word say? Look at policy, look at what people believe, and compare it to the Bible. Now, here's the thing. You're never going to find a perfect policy that matches this perfectly. Why? Because we have imperfect people that are running for office. It's the same reason I would say you're never going to find a perfect church. Why? Because there's imperfect humans that are leading the church. There's always going to be something that maybe happens or that you might not totally agree with, but you need to find somebody whose policy closely aligns with this as possible, and you need to vote accordingly. Amen, somebody? Amen. Last thing I'll remind you of this. Our peace is not in any human. Jesus is king. Jesus is not on the ballot because he doesn't want to be your president. He wants to be your king. Jesus is not on the ballot because he doesn't want to be your president. He wants to be your king. And he is the prince of peace. When I put my faith in humans, I will always be let down. Okay, I want to encourage you with this. Go do some research, get registered to vote, pray for our country, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework, and then go vote. Amen, somebody? 
we're going to continue talking more about that as we get a little bit closer to the election. But I can't, when you see how many people did not vote in the last election, um, it's, it's frustrating because you see how many people complain, right? I don't want to hear nobody complaining if you didn't vote, right? <laughs> if you sat on the sideline, you, you lost your voice in this arena, all right? Let's get into God's Word today. Hey, today we're talking about, the title for today's message is The Ditches of Increase. We've been in a season talking about increase. If we want to experience the increase of God in any area of our life, whether it's spiritually, uh, uh, physically, uh, emotionally, whatever it might be, um, there's things that we want to do. Here's what I would want to remind us of today. And we've been talking about this for the past several weeks, but God desires partnership. God desires partnership. Okay. I think a lot of times we hope that God just, well, God's going to do whatever God wants to do. And I don't have a part to play. God desires partnership. And here's why partnership requires relationship. Partnership requires relationship. When God partners with mere humans that are so far beneath him, when he partners with you and me, and we make a decision to partner with him, we then grow in relationship. I am forced to communicate with God, walk with God, uh, commune with God, spend time with God, worship God. I am now forced into willingly a relationship through our partnership to see his kingdom come, his will be done in my life as it is in heaven. See, we, 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 partnership requires relationship. There's no relationship with a vending machine. So what happens is sometimes I think in the modern, in the modern, especially in America, because we got it so good, we will bring our one dollar prayer to the vending machine of God and we'll submit it, and we we hope if we put in the right buttons that the thing is going to fall out and that prayer will be answered. Let's not cheapen prayer, cheapen our relationship, cheapen our partnership with God to a one dollar prayer in hopes that if I put the right buttons in, that the prayer is going to fall from heaven. God's not a vending machine. He's not a genie in a bottle, okay? He is the living God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning. The, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's so much higher than us, but how good is our God to be so much greater than, than us and then to say, you are my most precious creation. I want to partner with you. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do that, but he says, I want to partner with you because I want relationship with you. I want to be with you in those moments where you don't understand and you're trusting and you're walking by faith. I want to be there with you. That's the God that we serve. He's a personal God, not a distant God. He's a close God. And he invites us into this partnership. And so this is what we're going to see today. Uh, the ditches of increase. That may not make sense right now, but it will here in just a second. We're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 3. If you have your Bible, go to 2 Kings chapter 3. In this, in this story, uh, Israel is marching into battle. They're pursuing an enemy, and they, they march into a barren wasteland. And they've been marching for so long here that they find themselves in a place where there is no water. And so, the, I mean, you, know, you need some water whenever you're in a barren wasteland. So let's look at the, the, the beginning of the story. 2 Kings 3 verse 9. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab, which was their enemy. And so here's what happens. They get to the spot where they're, they're pursuing an enemy. They're working together. And they get to a spot where they think, well, you know what? God's led us out here just to give us over to our enemy. And this is a, a very poor perspective of the living God. Well, God's brought us here to abandon us. He's brought us here to leave us shorthanded. He's brought us here just to kind of push us out there and say, hey, hope you can figure it out, sink or swim. And that's not the situation that's going on. And as we get in here, finally, one of the kings, they, they have some back and forth. And, and you can read this story later this week. But they have some back and forth. And one of the kings, he speaks up and he says, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? At this point in time, they would have to go to the prophet and the prophet would then go before the Lord or call upon the name of the Lord and he would receive or they would receive a word from the Lord and they would instruct Israel what to do. And so here we see this, this, this one king finally speaks up and he says, is there no prophet here? Is there no prophet nearby that we can go and, and ask God, the living God, our God, what he wants us to do? And finally, one of them says, well, we know where Elisha is. He's the prophet. Elisha is here. And because Elisha respected the position of the king, then he goes and he seeks the Lord on their behalf. 
And this is where the story really gets interesting. But here's what I want us to see. Point number one, if I'm believing God for increase in my life in any area, number one, I got to seek God first. This is where they missed it. This is where they missed it. You see, they, they waited for the crisis and then they sought God. Let's be honest. How many times do we do this? Right? When life is good, somehow Bibles get dusty. Let me say that again. When life is good, somehow Bibles get dusty. But whenever somebody's in the hospital and they have a bad diagnosis or there's a crisis going on, I just got laid off from my job or just got cut from that team that I've been trying out for, all of a sudden, well, I got to seek God. I got I to find out. I got to, it's crisis mode. Scripture reminds us time and time again, let's seek God first. And Jesus said, what? All these things will be added to you. Uh, things will take care of. God will make sure that things are taken care of. But we seek God first. We don't wait for crisis and then run to God. Again, that's not good relationship with God. God's saying, don't just come to me when you're hungry for a snack from the vending machine of God. He's saying, I want to walk with you every day. I want to be with you every day. Seek me first every day. So here's what, here's what happens. Finally, they, they wise up. Let's go seek God and, and get some answers. 2 Kings 3 and verse 15. And here's what Elisha said. Here's what, uh, Elisha's response. He says, now, bring me a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him, him being Elisha. I want to remind you today that no matter what season or situation you're in, no matter how desperate uh, you may be for the increase of God to show up in your life, worship invites God's spirit to move at a greater level. Uh, in the New Testament, Paul tells Tim Timothy, he says, stir up the gift that's within you. Stir up, wh whose job is that? That's his job. He's saying you must stir up the spirit of God, the gift that is within you. And in doing so, one of the best ways we can do that is through worship. This is why every time we gather together, we spend moments in worship and we're not rushing through worship like, hey, we got three songs to get to, two songs to get to, and then we got to move on so people can, can get out of here and get to lunch. Who cares about lunch? We're in the presence of God. We're gathered together and we're stirring up the gift of the spirit. What, 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 uh, man, what great time we have, what a great opportunity we have in the presence of God at not just the, 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 the level of God is with me because I am his child, absolutely, but there's a manifest presence, a made known presence that's available when like-minded believers get together and we pursue God and not pursue one another. When we pursue God in his presence and not a performance from somebody else. And in those moments, we are stirring up this gift. Worship invites God's spirit to move at a greater level. We see this from the Old Testament to the New Testament. What does Elisha say? Bring me a musician. What am I, what's he doing? He's, he's stepping into the presence of God. He's not manipulating the atmosphere or the situation. No, he's genuinely getting into worshiping, humbling himself, getting into the presence of God. And then it says, after the musician played, then the spirit of God began to move after not, not, at the, not before, after. Why? Again, once again, whenever I am in those moments, I am saying, Lord, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to worship you and believe that as I get into your presence at a deeper level, that God's going to show up in ways that I can't even ask, think, or imagine greater than I could ever think of that he would show up. Never underestimate the power of worship during a time of great need. Never underestimate the power of worship during a time of great need. And here's what I would say. When you don't feel like worshiping, it's the most important time to worship. You ever been there? I mean, I've been there more times than I can count. I don't feel like worshiping. I feel like God's far from me. I'm heartbroken. I'm angry. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm sad. I'm depressed. I don't feel like worshiping. That's the most important time to say, in faith, I will worship. In faith, I will still worship. I could take it a step further. Whenever you don't feel like going to church, it's the most important time to go to church. When you don't feel like praying, it's the most important time to pray. When you don't feel like serving someone else, it's the most important time to serve someone else. This is the, the, the perfect example of what Jesus says in crucifying the flesh. If I let my feelings control me, my flesh is in control. But by faith, when I say, you know what, I don't feel like worshiping, but I will make a decision to crucify my flesh, and it's never a bad time to worship my Savior. 
I will get into his presence. Recently, Leslie and I, we were, um, we were on a little bit of a road trip together, and as we were going, and we, uh, we were, you know, going through some stuff, and we had, a, had some bad news that we found out, and um, to be honest with you, it was just, it was one of those times where both of us were, were confused and heartbroken, and, and, and there was a lot just emotionally and mentally going on. But as we were driving, uh, Leslie just turned on a worship playlist. We had about an hour and a half or so in the car, and it's amazing how just turning on a worship playlist in your vehicle, on the job site, in your home, how it will usher in the presence of the Prince of Peace into your life. And as we were driving, I didn't feel like worshiping, I'll be honest. But the presence of God met us in that vehicle. And the peace of God overtook our conversation. And we were able to just talk and minister to one another. And God spoke through each other, uh, each of us to each other. And it was a moment of, if we didn't make a decision to worship when we didn't feel like it, we would have missed out on a precious moment in our marriage, but with the presence of God in our marriage. Do you see what I'm saying? I've got to make a decision. I will seek God first, no matter what. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 6, he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'm not seeking God so I can get more increase. No, I'm seeking God because he's the living God. I'm seeking God because he has, he, he has eternal life. Where else would I go? What else can I seek that compares to him? I'm not seeking him so I can get more from him. No, I'm seeking him just because I want more of him. Well, I just want to be, I want to know you more. I want to be in your presence more. I want to be near you more. I want to talk to you more. That's why. Not, I don't want more stuff. If he's never done, if he doesn't do anything else for me, he's already done more than enough by saving my life through salvation. Amen, somebody? Seek God first. Point number two is this. I got to act in faith. I'm going to seek God first. I'm not going to wait for crisis to happen. No, I'm going to seek him first every day. When I open my eyes, I'm going to say, God, thank you for life today. Thank you that today's the day you have made. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be glad in it. Lord, thank you for showing me something fresh in your, in your word today as I read your word. I'm going to seek him first. I'm going to expect to hear from him every single day. I'm not going to wait for crisis. I'm going to be prepared for crisis. Amen, somebody? Act in faith. Let's continue in our story. 2 Kings 3, uh, verse 16 now. It says, and then uh, and he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. So here they are. They've been going seven days, Right? And they have no water. Their animals have no water. They've run out. They're, they're, they're in a bad spot. And here's, here's what God says. Make this valley full of ditches. Not what you want to hear necessarily, right? Verse 17. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. So let's talk about this. Make this valley full of of ditches. How do we prepare spiritually for an increase from God? If I'm believing for increase, how do we do it? Spiritually, I need to dig ditches. For your situation, it's probably not physically, right? You don't need to go home and make your backyard full of ditches. Please don't do that, okay? But spiritually, there might be other ways that you can figuratively dig ditches in preparation for what God's about to do, what he's about to do. Imagine the situation. Here they are. They're, they're, they're dehydrated. They're tired. They're thirsty. And God says, dig ditches. Again, not necessarily the word that you wanted. They were hoping God would say, hey, don't worry. It's going to rain tonight. <laughs> he says, dig ditches. Not one. Not just one little you know, five-gallon uh, hole for, for you and for your animals or something. No. Make this valley full of ditches. Dig many ditches ditches. By faith, dig ditches before you see any water, before you see any water, see the wind, experience it. Before you see it, dig ditches. And this is a classic situation of where God invites his people to partner with him. And the first response is normally, this doesn't make sense naturally. Lord, once it's, give us a few sprinkles, right? And then we'll start digging ditches. God says, I want to see your faith and digging ditches, not just a few, many, before I even send water your way. And through the level of their faith, they reveal it by how many ditches they are willing to dig. Well, God, why don't you just make it rain and we can just call it good? Wouldn't that be easier if you can just, just make it rain and, and, and it'll be totally fine? God's looking for partners. 
But this is, this is a reminder for us that as we partner with God, that faith is the catalyst to the miraculous move of God. Faith is the catalyst. What's that? That's the spark. That's the, the light. Think of a, a stick of dynamite in the fuse. That's the flame, the flame that lights the fuse. That's the catalyst to the, the, the reaction that's about to take place. And that's exactly how it is in the spiritual realm. Faith is the catalyst. It's the thing that starts the process for the power of God to move in our lives. But it starts with somebody saying, I have the faith to dig ditches. I have the faith to do something about it. And we will only catch, you will only catch in your life the amount of faith, the amount of water that your faith is prepared for. You're only going to catch the amount of water, spiritually increased, whatever it might be, that you have the faith to prepare for. So if I'm believing God for a pay raise, right? Like, I, I, man, I want my boss to notice me. I'm believing for a pay raise. Okay, good. I can dig some ditches by doing what? I can show up early. I can have the best attitude on the job site, in the office. I can be willing to stay late when no one else is. I will go above and beyond. I'm gonna start thinking like an owner. If this was my business, if this was my school, if this was my sports team, whatever it might be, I'm gonna go above and beyond. How would I treat it? How would I treat other people? How would I lead this team? I'm gonna dig, those are digging ditches for increase of financial increase at my job. I'm gonna make a decision to do something in order to prepare to receive what God has for me. I'm believing to God to be debt-free. Good. Do you have a budget? Have you gone through? Are you cutting out extra spending? Like those are digging ditches so that God can bring increase your way. Well, I want my coach to notice me and to, to see me and to start me on my sports team. Good. Are you acting like a leader? Or are you just following other people's examples? Am I acting like a leader? Or am I just following everybody else's example? Because that's not what a leader does. You see, all of us, we have ways, whatever you're believing God for increase in your life, we have ways where we can spiritually dig ditches. It's not physically digging a ditch, but there's something in, in your hands that you can do to prepare for what God wants to do in your life. And that's what I want us to see. We have to act in faith. And most of the time, it doesn't make sense naturally. I would say maybe never. <laughs> Usually never makes sense naturally. And, and here's the decision. I can take one step of faith, right, and, and dig one ditch and be satisfied for a moment. But what I've found in walking with God is that every step of faith is followed by more steps of faith. Most people want to share their story and they want to say, well, yeah, we stepped out in faith that one time and God moved and that was the only time we ever really stepped out in faith. That was our step of faith. Okay, let me tell you something. Every step of faith is followed by more steps of faith. I like to picture like a, a faith snowball. It may start small, but as that thing begins to roll, it gains momentum. And as it gains momentum, it gains size. And your faith begins to grow as you walk with God because you experience his goodness. You see his faithfulness. You step out in faith and you see that God did show up like he said he was going to. God did help like he said he was going to help. And in doing so, you then have faith for the next thing and the next step and the next step after that. It is a lifelong journey of walking with God. It's not a momentary thing. And so you have these decisions. I can dig one ditch in my life and be satisfied for a moment, or I can dig many ditches, meaning every day I'm going to choose to live by faith and I can find fulfillment. I can be satisfied for a moment by taking one step, or I can choose that every day Lord, lead me in steps of faith. Show me what I can do today. What are, what are, what are the things I can do today? and help me do the next thing tomorrow. And in doing so, I can live fulfilled. And here's what's encouraging. As you look at the principle of this story, he says, not only will your animal, you be, you be satisfied with the water, but he said your animals and the people around you as well. And this is the spiritual principle for, for us in the New Testament. It's not just for you, but it's for the people around you. And it's for everyone in your life. It is an overflowing situation that when you live by faith and you dig many ditches for his kingdom in the spiritual realm, everyone around you is blessed and they receive the living, miraculous water of the gospel. I'm not digging ditches just for me. I'm not living by faith just for me. I'm doing it for my spouse, I'm doing it for my kids. I'm doing it for my coworkers. I'm doing it for my neighbors. I'm doing it for every I'm doing it for all the other kids on my, my kids' sports team. I'm I'm living by faith believing that the living water of God and the increase of God as it comes into my life, that it will also flow into their life because I've dug ditches all in my life. I love that Elisha says, this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. It hasn't rained. But he said, this is a simple thing. You know what the hard thing is? People obeying. Why? 
God, I'm tired. I have no energy. I haven't drank any water in days. And you want me to dig ditches? You want me to pick up this shovel and start making this valley full of ditches here? The hard part is people obeying. Is digging ditches whenever there's not a cloud in the sky. That's the hard part. But I want to remind you that for God, it's an easy thing. This is a simple thing in the sight of the Lord. But how many times do we doubt God because of the natural impossibility of the situation? It seems impossible naturally, so we let doubt rob us from a miracle of increase. Rather than, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you, and I'm just going to have the faith to take a step and to walk this out. We think of miracles as, as few and far between maybe in our lives, but let me remind you that God does miracles with every breath. God does miracles with every breath, and that's all that it takes for God's increase to work and to go to work in your life. We serve a miracle-working God. And what I love is that he says, I'm going to send you water when you dig these ditches. And at the very end there, what does he say? And I'm going to give you victory. Our God is this good. He's always a step ahead. He says, I'm going to satisfy you, give you water for now, which is a miracle. And guess what? I'm going to give you victory tomorrow. I'm going to satisfy you now. I'm going to give you victory in the next season. I'm going to satisfy you now, take care of the immediate need, but I'm also going to move in your life in such a way where you can see my hand working in the next season as well. That's the God that we serve. Always a step ahead, multiple steps ahead. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. I like to say it this way. There's never just a different way of looking at it, but it's saying this, we can walk by God's vision or we can walk by man's sight. I want to choose to walk by God's vision, not by man's sight. In 2 Kings 3.17, it says, For thus says the Lord, he says, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. You're not going to see it. Even in the Old Testament to the New Testament, God is always saying, Get your eyes off of your circumstance and put it back on me. Get your eyes off the situation and put it back on him. He's always saying, Look to me. Look to me, look to, look to your heavenly father. Stop looking around you and maybe how bad it looks or what's going on or how you feel like everything's crumbling in, pushing down upon you. Stop looking at the things and start looking at the creator, the living God who has you, who's looking at, who's for you and not against you. Greater is he than anything that is in this world. He's saying, look to me. You will not see when you will not see rain. Learning to live with God's vision, it will change your life because you're truly walking by faith. Here's an example. You may see a bad diagnosis from the doctor, but you can have a vision for healing. You see, sight is what I see when my eyes are open. Vision is what I see when my eyes are closed. Lord, show me your will. Remind me of your word. Lord, show me what your will is for this situation right now. Sight is what I see when my eyes are open. Usually when I'm looking at what I see with my eyes open, it looks bad. It looks bad. This is one of the biggest things that I've had to do since I've been in ministry is there's times where I walk into situations and what I see with my natural eyes looks bad. But God's called me to live by faith. I've, I've had to walk into to hospital rooms. And you walk in, and, and it's bad. There's times where it's, it's bad, and it, it looks like there's no hope. And if you, if you focus on what you can see, it'll steal your faith. When normally I've been called to come to the hospital to pray for healing, to pray in faith, according to James chapter 5, that we would pray and anoint with oil, and the prayer of faith would raise up the sick and to heal them. But if I look too long with my eyes and I get consumed with what I see, it will steal my faith. And you got to have a little bit of resolve in you as you mature spiritually to say, it doesn't matter what I see. What matters is what I know in here based on God's word. Lord, I have your vision. Lord, I know this looks bad, and I, but I have a vision for healing. And there's been times where I've walked in and, and it's looked bad. And I've prayed and we've seen miraculous things take place. But there's also been times where I've walked in and it looks bad and I've prayed and I haven't seen the answer that I was praying for. But I promise you this, no matter what the outcome, my faith is never in, and our faith should never be in our circumstance. 
It's in the finished work of Jesus. Lord, I don't know why. I don't know what exactly what happened with that. I don't know why it didn't work out how I was hoping it would work out, but Lord, I trust you. That's walking by faith and not by sight. I, can, I, can, I may see a marriage that is on the brink of divorce, but I can have a vision for restoration and for healing. I may see my child that is far from God, but I can have a vision for their salvation. You see, digging ditches, it shows God the measure of my faith. How much am I willing to partner with him to see his kingdom come, his will be done in my life as it is in heaven? What, what am I willing to do in preparation for what God is about to do? And so the question for us is, what spiritual ditches am I digging in the area of my life that I need God to move? What are you, what are you doing to prepare for what God wants to do in your life in this specific area? And here's the most encouraging thing. I heard a pastor say this a long time ago. He reminded me, he said, here's the good news. You don't have to have the faith to finish. You just have to have the faith to start. Sometimes you're looking at a situation in your life and it seems impossible and it seems crushing and it seems like there's no way this can work out. And you think you gotta have some type of crazy amount of faith to get you to the finish line. But I believe you just gotta have the faith to start. Mustard seed, tiny amount of faith. This much faith can change everything. And once I do, again, it begins to start that faith snowball that grows and builds with momentum until I see what God needs to be done in my life. You don't, have the faith, you don't have to have the faith to finish, just the faith to start. Point number three is this. Remember that we serve the God of suddenly. We serve the God of suddenly. You see, you never know when your day is, <laughs> when your day is here, when your day of breakthrough is here, when your day of healing is here, when your day of freedom is here, when you've been praying for 10 years, but today's the day. <laughs> that that prayer is answered. You have no idea. We serve the God of suddenly. And sometimes we pray and on, on minute one, as soon as we pray, there's an answered prayer and there's a miracle that takes place. And that's always where my faith is. Lord, if I'm gonna pray for somebody that's sick, pray for somebody that's in pain, pray for somebody that's in need, I'm praying that as I finish this prayer, boom, God's power's moving. My prayer is always there, but sometimes it might take a, a process, but you have no idea when suddenly is about to take place. We serve a God of suddenly. Suddenly, an angel appeared to Mary. Suddenly, a man received strength in his legs. Suddenly, the storm ceased. We serve a God of suddenlies. And this is what we see in this, 2 Kings 3, verse 20. Now, what happened in the morning when the grain offering was, was offered that suddenly, everybody say suddenly, suddenly water came by the way of Edom. And the, la and the land was filled with water. Many different commentaries and, and theologians, they have a, a little bit of a, a disagreement on how exactly it came, by rain or, or, or by flowing. Or, and some even believe that the, the water filled the ditches from under the earth, that it came up miraculously into the ditches and it worked its way through the land. Either way, a miracle took place. When? Suddenly. You see, we don't have to be concerned with how God's gonna do it. I just gotta have the faith that God is who he says he is and his word is true no matter what. Suddenly, water came. When did the God of suddenly move? It says, after the offering was made. After the offering was made, what a great reminder for us that worship, scripture calls it a sacrifice of praise, that it invites God's miraculous power. Worship, our, our sacrifice of praise, it, it invites God's miraculous power. It's what I said earlier. Why is it important for me to worship when I don't feel like worshiping? After the offering, <laughs> suddenly God moved. There's something about pursuing God's presence, pursuing him, not just for more stuff, but there's something about pursuing him with a humble and genuine heart to say, God, I trust you with everything. I trust you with timing. I trust you with the provision. I trust you with my marriage. I trust you with my kids. And I don't know how it's gonna work out, but I trust you and I worship you. And you have no idea when God's breath will breathe a suddenly miracle into your life. But what great motivation to get up every day. Lord, I'm believing today's the day of suddenly for me. I'm believing that today's the day of suddenly. 
And if I get to the end of my day and I'm going to bed and I'm just like, well, it wasn't today, guess what? Lord, I thank you. I'm one day closer to suddenly. God, I thank you that I'm one day closer than I was. Um, I can't wait to see what you do tomorrow. I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. When God sent the answer, when he sent the provision, when he sent the blessing here, they were prepared to receive it. Many times we're praying for, for God to, to bring increase, but we aren't prepared to receive what he desires to do. Am I prepared to receive what God desires to do? Am I partnering? Am I walking? Am I trusting? Am I communicating? Am I communing with him? And in doing so, growing in my relationship with him and opening and just saying, Lord, this is, this is your situation. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I would encourage you with this. Whatever you're believing for, wherever you're believing for increase, ask God, Lord, what is my part? Lord, what's my part to play in this? What's my part to do? What can I do, Lord, with what you put in my hand, with the situation, with the family, with the, with the marriage, with, with the kids? What's my part to play? to see your kingdom come and your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. And I promise you, the Lord will reveal to you what things you can do right now. What can I do right now? He'll show you. He's a good father. He doesn't wanna keep it from you. He wants to reveal it to you. With all this in mind, I'm believing that this, this, this prayer is, is for us personally. This is for our lives personally. I'm believing for increase in your life, whatever area you're believing it for it in. I'm believing that God's going to move. But I also, as we've been talking over the last month or so, we're, we're believing this for our church as well. Amen. We're believing for continued increase in our church as well. And in doing so, we're going to do our part to prepare for what God desires to do in this place and in this family, in this church family. And so what we're gonna do is, is, that means that we're gonna dig some ditches in preparation for the increase that God is bringing so we can capture all. We can capture all of it. And so I mentioned this last week, but I'm gonna mention it again and just continue to remind you some very, very exciting news. There's two things that we need to do in order to prepare to, to capture all of the increase that I believe that God wants to bring for our church. And one of the first things that we need to do is we gotta create some room for increase. And we've been talking about this for over a month. And so I wanna just, again, I announced it last week, but I'm gonna officially announce it again today that starting next Sunday in uh, October, October 6th, we are gonna be going from a 10 o'clock service. We're moving to a 9 a.m. service and an 11 a.m. service. That's worth celebrating. Come on, somebody. And for us, it's those moments of, all right, Lord, we're gonna dig some ditches. Not just one, we're gonna dig many ditches. We're gonna prepare a lot of room for people to come. And we're gonna believe that as we partner with God to do our part, and as we launch this second service here, that we're spiritually digging ditches in faith and we're believing that Jesus will fill these ditches with, with, with so many people that we won't have room enough to contain it. That we'll say, all right, man, Lord, help us now steward the people that he's bringing. But we've gotta create a little bit of room. And so next Sunday, if you show up at 10, uh, you're either going to be very late or very early. So um, don't show up at 10, 9 a.m. or an 11 a.m. service. Second thing I need you to do is this. I need you to be a prayer and a bringer. I need you to be a prayer and a bringer. Great revivals are born with great amounts of prayer. People don't show up to abide church by accident. Now I'll tell you, we pray them in. Every week, we are pleading with God. Lord, I'm pleading with God. Lord, would you put lost people in the path of our church people so that we can minister to them, reveal the kingdom of God to them this week, and then also invite them into a church family where they can be planted and they can flourish in the courts of our God. Amen. It, only, it doesn't happen by accident. The Lord will build his church. How? With partnership through his people. When we pray for the lost and we pray for opportunities, and then when God presents the opportunity with our neighbor, with our coworker, with our customer, we now have an opportunity to say, Lord, I'm gonna operate by faith. I, I, I've never invited anybody to church before, but I'm gonna be a bringer. And God, I'm just gonna trust you. You're gonna help me not fumble over my words or be too nervous and watch what God would do if I have the faith to move. Be a prayer, be a bringer. It says after they sought God and after the offering was made that the increase came, we're going to seek God. We're gonna worship God this week and we're gonna pray and believe that this next month in October, we're gonna see increase like we've never seen before. Not just more people in seats, 
the increase we're believing for is more salvations than ever before. That more people far from God will come into his presence, experience him in a new way or for the first time ever, and they will be so changed by his presence and in a community of pe people that are pointing them to him that they will come forward, receive salvation, and they'll say, I can't wait to get back into the presence of God with my church family. We're believing for people that are far from God to come into this place. So I'm gonna ask you to commit to praying daily for Abide Church, commit to praying daily for myself, for our leadership team, and be a bringer. When you invite people, you're digging a ditch in faith and saying, Lord, will you help me? Will you help me invite people, bring people into this place? Friends, this is an exciting time to be at Abide Church. And I don't have all the pictures and I don't have everything worked out. And I don't know exactly how God's gonna do everything, but I do know this. God looks for partners. When we do our part in obedience to what God's asking us to do, he does the miraculous. And then we get to watch and sit back and see and say, look what the Lord has done. Not look what we built, not look what we're doing, look what the Lord has done. And at the end of the day, as many people come into the family of God through Abide Church, we get to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us the opportunity to represent him to our community. Amen. When you leave today, we have some brand new invite cards. They, they look like the old ones, but they have our new service time on here. As you leave, by the very front door, we have our Be A Bringer table. There's blessing cards on there, but there's also these brand new invite cards. If you have some of these in your wallet, the old ones, throw them out. The new ones have our new service time on there. Please clear out that table. Take as many as you need. We can restock. We can buy more if we need to. Clear out that table. Invite and pray. Be specific, and God will open the door for you to invite people. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for today. Thank you for your word that it guides us, that, it, that it's a light for us so we can see spiritually how to walk and how to navigate this life. And so, Lord, I pray that today your word, it would, it would just go deep into our heart. It would reveal things, Lord, that you would speak to us so we know what is our part to play for the area of increase that you're desiring to bring. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would give us not only the wisdom to see it, but the faith, Lord. Help us have the faith as our, our help or through the Holy Spirit, help us have the faith to, to walk it out. And God, I pray specifically for our church. I pray, Lord, that as we make room for increase, as we're digging ditches spiritually, Lord, as we go to these two services, Lord, would you bring people, put people in our path, Lord, so that we can bring them into your presence. And God, I pray that beginning next weekend, that we are stepping into a season of revival at Abide Church where people are running to the altar to sacrifice that, and give their life to you, Lord, to lay it down at your feet and follow you. Uh, God, I thank you for it. I thank you that over these next several weeks, we're gonna see a great harvest of people that are far from you. And at the end of all of it, we're gonna give you all the glory because you deserve it. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, I'm gonna go.